the things that they thought was, were going to help did not help, and in many cases made things much worse. Uh, one would be the welfare state. They say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. This might be that road. It's covered thick with good intentions. In the mid-1960s and throughout the 70s and early 80s, federal and state governments poured immense energy and well over a trillion dollars into the task of relieving poverty and promoting equality. The result, a complete failure. For many blacks at the lower end of the economic spectrum, the future looks more hopeless today than it did 20 years ago. As of 1960, two-thirds of all black American children were living with both parents. That declined over the years until only one-third were living with both parents in 1995. Among black families in poverty, 85% of the children had no father present, close yeah. quote. So it's not the legacy of slavery, slavery that destroys the African-American it's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the legacy of the welfare state. And why does the welfare state dissolve the family structure? For one thing, uh, it makes it unnecessary for fathers to uh, support their, their, their offspring. And in fact, it makes it counterproductive in many cases. A very poor man who, who might be able to support his family realizes his family will be better off without him. Lyndon Johnson sent people walk, knocking on doors. I, I, I lived in the 60s, and people knocked on doors, apprising women of their availability to welfare, provided there was no man in the house. Uh, and we went from 25% of blacks being born outside of wedlock in 65 to 75% right now. 95% of the men in our federal prison system have no relationship with their dad. Uh, if you look at the, um, the, the breakdown of the black family, and matter of fact, uh, maybe breakdown is a poor term to use. The black family does not form in the first place. You're, cre you're creating a situation where if the man stays there, the, the government will not give, them, give the woman welfare. Uh, and if he leaves, he, he, uh, it will. And so they're, pay they're paying, they're, when you pay people not to get married, more people don't get married. 1890, 1900, you look at census reports, a black kid, believe it or not, was slightly more likely to be born to a nuclear intact family than a white kid. Even during slavery, uh, a black kid was more likely to be born under a roof with his biological mother and biological father than today. What's happened is we launched this so-called war on poverty in the 60s. I know firsthand about welfare, welfare dependency because of my own life living seven years in and out. In the 60s, when they started the social engineering, black family life was relatively intact. 22 percent out of wedlock birth rates. Today, 72 percent. They collapsed the family. I came from a broken home, but in my day that was unusual. Black families were almost as stable as white families. The black family did not start falling apart until the 1960s, as more blacks were lured into the welfare culture. In the black community up until 1960s, there was a stigma associated with being on relief. Illegitimacy rate among blacks is somewhere around 70%. And back in the 40s, it couldn't have been more than 13, 12%, uh, something like that. Or the, the breakdown in the black family, only 35% of kids, uh, black kids live in two-parent two families. And matter of fact, when we were coming up, my, my father deserted us when I was three and my sister was two, and my, they ultimately got divorced in, night, in the late uh, uh, 40s. But, uh, but among, our ki among our friends, we were the only kids in the Richard Allen Housing Project that did not have a mother and father in the house. And, uh, and today would be exactly the opposite. It would be rare to have a mother and father in the, uh, in the household today. Someone who's st strictly irresponsible, either the man or the woman or both, now pays no price for being irresponsible. The, the taxpayers pay the price. And actually the, the harm done to the taxpayers, which is serious, still is not, com not comparable to the harm done to the, pe to the families, especially the children. To the kids. Yeah. The LA Times uh, had a poll where both poor people and non-poor people were asked the following question. Do young poor women often have children to get welfare benefits? Not too surprisingly, the majority of non-poor people said no. 44% said that young poor women often have children to get welfare benefits. Most did not believe that. 
Poor people were asked the same question. Do you believe that young poor women often have children to get welfare benefits? 64% said often. So they're telling us we're just not listening. Like some giant drug pusher, their government has lured them into dependency on a system that will maintain them in permanent poverty. Back when I was coming up, uh, that is for a girl to have a, uh, a baby out of wedlock, it was a disgrace. Today, uh, women have babies out of wedlock and they have uh, baby showers. It's no, it's no longer a disgrace. Children raised without, without two parents present. That was about 22% in 1960. One generation later, it was 67%. And it's gone up a little since then as well. And, some, and, the, and now the rate among whites is higher than it was among blacks in 1960. Right, right. Uh, so, this, so if you look at what actually happens in the wake of these wonderful sounding policies, uh, you see disaster after disaster. Prior to the 1960s, pathology was never associated with poverty. People who were sharecroppers didn't rob folks or rob banks to do things like that. Poverty was never associated with aberrant behavior. What happened was in the 1960s and the outer wedlock births occurred starting in the 60s with the poverty programs in the welfare state. The welfare state became an invading army into the black community. This whole notion that we should even have a war on poverty um, dismisses the fact that individuals uh, have a role in their own lives. Well, there, there are actually books uh, with titles and subtitles about the origins of poverty. Well, the entire human species began in poverty. So I don't know how, how, how we're going to say, what, what is the origin uh, of this, perhaps in the Garden of Eden or, or someplace? Uh, there's no explanation needed for poverty. The, the, the species began in poverty. So what you really need to know is how, what are the things that enable some countries and some groups within countries uh, to become prosperous. We have accepted this narrative that what we see today in black in America uh, is a result of the legacy of slavery and Jim Crow. And what I argue in the book is that um, what we see today is the legacy of the Great Society, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> of the legacy of 60s programs that were well-intentioned, um, trying to help uh, low-income blacks in particular, but had uh, unintended consequences. And, and today we see um, uh, the consequences uh, that uh, those policies um, uh, and gender. The very people who want this war on poverty are the ones standing away of parents having choice in education. The federal government now takes 25% of the American economy, forcing the public square to become a battleground of constant conflict. 70 cents of every dollar for the last 50 years that of the 22 trillion spent on poverty went not to the poor, but those who serve poor people. Means-tested federal welfare programs alone are $900 billion annually a quarter of our national budget. When you think about the civil rights movement, it was a movement to remove governmental barriers. Jim Crow was a governmental barrier. Remove these barriers so that we can educate, so that we can attain um, economic success. Uh, rather than us continue on that journey to say, okay, we've removed these barriers, now go live free, uh, many that took up the mantle after Dr. King's death went to Washington and politicized the movement. And so you started seeing the interest of the community move toward government intervention. When you think about government intervention, not only did the welfare class uh, start to unravel that entire community, uh, the working class started to become addicted to government. Today, the government is the number one employer of black men and the second largest employer of black women. This should not occur in a free society. You see, you can't have a welfare state in a democratic country unless you first have a welfare state vision. And when you buy all the assumptions of that vision, then you're buying a lot of trouble. In 1960, 20% of Americans got more from government than they put in. Today, 60% of Americans get more from government than they put in. I think any economist, economist would tell you that if you tax something, you're gonna get less of it. And if you subsidize something, you're gonna get more of it, whether it's wheat, cheese, or slovenly behavior. And indeed, in the United States, we have been subsidizing slovenly behavior. That is, we have been making the cost of illegitimacy or having kids out of wedlock relatively cheap. You say that the government has exacerbated the plight of these poor blacks? Yes. How? A number of ways. One, they've made it difficult to get jobs, to get started in the job market. Minimum wage law would be one of those things, but only one. 
Uh, the terrible schooling would be uh, a major factor. That if you are going to turn out kids who are 40 percent uh, functionally illiterate upon graduation from high school, then you're going to have very serious problems in the job market. And the government is responsible for that. The government Through runs the, the schools. schools. Yes, mm -hmm. state and state as well as federal. Uh, they're doing many things to make it much tougher for the person at the bottom to get started, uh, and they're also making it uh, less necessary to get started by having various subsidy programs, food stamps, welfare, and so on which uh, uh, reduce the difference between working and not working. So that the, the general tendency of what they're doing is to make it harder to rise. When you look at programs, you, sh you should ignore their intentions and ask, what is the effect? And I think that the effect of uh, welfare uh, has been devastating for, uh, for black Americans. Do you have to destroy the, do you have to undo, unravel the great society programs? in order to permit ordinary human flourishing to begin taking place again? Those programs that have in place perverse incentives, yes, you do need to get rid of them. Um, you, you, you can't replace a, a, a father in the home with, with a check. Um, it just doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, the government's not very good at raising children <laughs> or, or being husbands. Not uh, they're, 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 not very, they're not very good at it. So yes, the right incentives do need to be in place. Two things. Number one, you've got to be able to identify who they are amongst us that absolutely cannot help themselves. They have no one. They have no resources. That's actually one reason we should ha not have the government in this business. They can't identify. This is only done on a very local and personal level. Number two, once we've identified them, how do we help? How do we really help those that cannot help themselves? Well, you empower their charities. Local charities need empowerment. How do you do that? Does the government redistribute $700 billion, or do you allow free people to freely give to the charity they most want to? When you think about it, I mean, uh Centuries of slavery, generations of Jim Crow did not destroy the black family, but one, one generation of the welfare state did. What we've done, in my opinion, is we've economically incentivized women to marry the government, and we've allowed men to abandon their financial and moral responsibility, and now we have this. What we have in our country is poverty of the spirit. That is where people have become dependent uh, on on government programs and they're not they're not self-sufficient. That's the kind of poverty that we have today Why is it that we still have this prevailing social vision that seems not only not at, to ask? What are the results are our fine intentions actually achieving the ends we wish for but almost refuses to look at the massive evidence to the contrary it was counterproductive So what's going on? Partly what's going on among professional politicians is that it can be the end of a whole career to admit that you were wrong. Imagine you're president and you send men into battle in a war and they get wiped out and you say, you know, we really didn't have to fight that war. Uh, <laughs> that, that is not something you're going to say. It's something you're not likely to say to yourself. There'll be a thousand rationalizations and the ability of the human mind to rationalize is just phenomenal.